May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning, Cathedral family. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Really, God? You have got to be kidding. When I first read the gospel lesson for this morning, I was more than a bit incredulous. Indeed, I went back to check the lectionary to see if I had the right day because it had to be a divine joke that during these very divided times in which we find ourselves, we are actually reading a gospel where Jesus is saying, you think I've come to bring peace? That would be a no. Rather, I have come to bring division. Really, Jesus? We don't need you for that. Maybe your first century world needed a little divisive shaking up, but not our 21st century world. Yet here is the thing. Jesus' world was no less divided than our own. His was a time of religious, political, and socioeconomic turmoil. Sound familiar? The diversity of languages from Hebrew to Greek to Aramaic to Latin bespoke the diversity of the religious and political beliefs. And with the diversity came divisive conflict. Not to speak of the century-long hostilities between Samaritans and Jews or the divides between the powerful and wealthy classes versus the poor and marginalized classes. So if there was peace and harmony to be found in Jesus' first century world, it was fragile at best, as it could not overcome the deep divides that were a part of his day. And the same can be said, by the way, for the world of the Lucan Gospel written 30 more years or so after Jesus' death. For it too was defined by strong divides between the rich and the poor, not to speak of the profound differences created around concerns about Jesus' delayed return and hence the delay of the promised future when all would be set right side up. And so this begs the question, what in the world was Jesus thinking? Why would Jesus want to bring more division to an already divided world? What kind of divisions are these that he dares to bring? And what does that mean for us, an already much too separated people, in a time defined by devastating, if not deadly, divides? I have come to bring not peace, but division, Jesus proclaims. The division that Jesus brings is the division created by the very promised future of God's that Jesus so perfectly reveals through his ministry and his person. This church is a future that is nothing less than a new order of things. It is a new order where the peace that is the justice of God is made real, a peace where the first are last and the last are first, not as I have said before, because there is an exchange or swapping of positions between the haves and the have-nots or the insiders and the outsiders or the privileged or the oppressed. No, the first are last and the last are first because there is no difference between them. All are treated as the equal children of God that they are, period. And so it is that if indeed we are going to be a people of faith, that is a people committed to partnering with God and bringing forth the future that God promises, then there must be divisions divisions that signal the coming of that very just future. And so again, what kind of divisions are these that reflect not earthly ways, but the ways of God's heavens? 
It is the division between hubris and humility. In ancient Greek culture, hubris referred to the intentional use of violence to degrade or humiliate someone, be it violent words or violent actions. Depending upon the nature of the violence, hubris was considered a crime. But whether or not a crime, hubris was seen as a violation of the divine order of things, a violation of divine creation, put simply a violation of who we are created to be. It is in this way that hubris is nothing less than behavior that is at once self-aggrandizing and dehumanizing if not sinful, for it is about a false sense of self, that is a sense of self in which one sees oneself as more than one ought and hence sees oneself as worthier than another. Such hubris is the mark of a dangerously divided present. Yet the future that is God's is a future defined not by hubris, but by humility as from the word hummus for earth. From dust we are, to dust we shall return. Or to quote my sister, as some of you have heard me do before, we are all nothing but dressed up dirt. And what could be better than that? For each and every one of us, with our uniqueness of language, of color, of culture, of religion, of gendered identity and sexual expression, you name it, each and every single solitary one of us are creations of God, made from God's very dust, nothing more and nothing less. And in my book, that's pretty darn good. I have come to bring division, Jesus proclaims. This is a proclamation call to separate ourselves from a culture, a climate, and ways of being that would suggest that there are persons more valuable or less valuable, more entitled or less entitled, more important or less important than any other human being that God has created. And as far as I know, that is everyone that has or has ever had breath. We therefore are called to nurture a community and culture of humility that regards everyone as the sacred dust that they are, regardless of who they are or where they come from. And if this means a division from that which is hubris, well, such is the way toward God's just future. I have come to bring division Jesus proclaims, what kind of division is this? It is the division, yes, between hubris and humility and between complacency and conviction. Jesus' very proclamation summons us to have the conviction of character, to witness to the very values that bespeak who we are as sacred creatures, values that reflect our divine character values such as integrity, decency, and honor. To possess conviction of character means that we cannot be peacefully complacent in the wake of anything or anyone that dares to assail our integrity, offend our decency, or insult our honor as those created in the image of God. Rather, we must speak up, stand up, and show up in witness to the image of the one in whom we are all created. To do anything less, dear church, would be to betray who God has created us to be as God's children. Thus, we must overcome the complacency that is silent, that is resignation, that is indifference. We must overcome this complacency with the conviction of divine character to foster the steadfast integrity, the loving decency, and the just honor that is God. And if this means a division from that which is complacent with the way things are, well, such is the way to God's just future. I have come to bring division, Jesus proclaims. What kind of division is this? When it comes right down to it, 
It is a division between abjection and aspiration. Jesus calls us not to be an abject people. That is, a people who are deprived of the basics of what it means to be humane. And thus, a people who settle for the lowest state or condition of our humanity. Thus, a debased people with low regard for ourselves and for that matter, for our future. Instead, Jesus calls us to be an aspirational people. That is a people who have a strong desire to, to become better, a strong desire to achieve something greater. Put simply, we are not to sink down to the lowest common denominator, if you will, of what it means to be human, thus becoming little more than a spiritless people, giving up on our better selves, giving up on our God's just earth. Rather, we are to reach upward toward the greatest potential of our divine being as a spirited people, a people energized to live into the good creation that we are and into God's good kingdom. And so anytime, anytime we are tempted to sink to the abject levels of our present, you know what we should do? We should take a breath. For this is what it means to be a people of aspiration. For aspiration is about taking in that breath that is the spirit of God, the spirit that encourages and empowers us to reach to the heights of God's hope for us. And so, even when all around us goes low, we are to take a breath and reach high. And if this means a division between that which is abjection and aspiration, well, so be it. For this is the way to God's just future. You think that I have come to bring peace, Jesus said? No, I have come to bring division the kind of division that leads the way to God's promised kingdom the division that is humility, not hubris, conviction, not complacency, and aspiration, not objection. Church, here is the thing to know. Jesus' mission is not about wreaking havoc. It is, however, about valuing one thing over the other valuing the way of God's future versus the way of our present. And so it is that when it comes right down to it, Jesus' proclamation is a clarion call for us, for us to make a decision about who we are and who we want to become as a people, as a society, as a world. But it is even about more than that. For we need to decide if we truly believe in ourselves and in our God. Do we believe that we are in fact God's children, created to be good? Do we believe in God's promise that the way things are is not the way they are going to be? Bottom line, do we believe that we can be better and that our world can be better. And if we say yes, if we really believe in ourselves and in our God, then we must decide to overcome the divides of our present by living into the divisions that reflect God's just future. And as I say this, on this August 18th day, I am reminded of that August 18th day in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, giving women the right to vote. And this I know to be true. The road to the 19th Amendment didn't go down easy. It created divisions between husbands and wives, sons and daughters, men and women. It disrupted a society. 
Yet because women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Sojourner Truth believed that we could be better than that, they conquered the gender divide with the humility, conviction, and aspirations that are the divisions of God's future. And so on this day, we celebrate 99 years of women going to the ballot box and voting. And yes, on this day, I am reminded of James Meredith, who on this very day in 1963 graduated from the University of Mississippi. In this I know also to be true. James Meredith's road to walking across the Ole Miss stage to receive his diploma didn't go down easy. It created divisions between white men and black men, white women and black women, white children and black children. It disrupted a society and a people. Yet, because James Meredith believed that we could be better, he conquered the social divides of race with the humility, conviction, and aspirations that are the divisions of God's future. And so on this day, some 56 years later, black students and white students study together in the heart of Mississippi and across the land. And here, on this August 18th day, 400 years and four days after, 20 African people were brought to Virginia, marking the beginning of chattel slavery in this country. Yet, as essayist Nicole Hannah-Jones tells us, black people, she says, have seen the worst of America, yet somehow they still believed in its best. This people, my people, who suffered the degradation of slavery and its legacy, decided to shun the divides of hubris, complacency, and objection that enslaved them and to embrace instead the divisions of humility, conviction, and aspirations that promises a better people, a better world, a just future. And I stand here in this pulpit as a legacy to their decision. And so it is left for each and every one of us, for you and for me, to decide, to decide if we want to settle for the divides that make us less than who we are, or if we will choose the divisions that make us a better people, a better world, and that lead us to God's just future. Church, as it was in Jesus' time, and in Luke's time, it is in this our time that we hear the proclamation call of Jesus. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather divisions. Amen. <laughs>